tonight. Um, our executive director of Aspen Journalism, Curtis Wackerly, is going to be moderating the conversation. And quick introduction of Curtis, he uh, worked at the Aspen Daily News for 14 years, was its chief editor for four years. He's been with Aspen Journalism almost three years and our executive director for um, a year and a half. So please welcome Ted Conover and Curtis Wackerly. Thank you very much, Mark, for that introduction, and thank you so much, Ted, for being here tonight. Um, you know, you are one of my personal journalism heroes uh, for a lot of reasons, and it, I, I really uh, came to that conclusion uh, after reading New Jack because of how it started in a lot of ways, where uh, you had uh, made an official request and you went in through the front door, as, as, you, uh, as you often start, uh, to the shadow a class of recruits at the Correctional Officer Academy in New York State, uh, and were denied. And you did what, you know, I think every, it, some version of this is in every journalist's head when you get the no comment. <laughs> you know, uh, but you, you said, okay, well, I, I'm going to go ahead and apply and become uh, accepted to the Academy, go through it. Uh, for a couple of months and, and spent 10 months working at a notorious maximum security prison and wrote an absolutely brilliant book. So, um, <clears throat> so that is, uh, is something I'm deeply in awe of and, and your whole career is, is um, something to behold. So thank you so much for being here and for traveling to Aspen and for your support of Aspen Journalism here. Deeply grateful. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, throw a couple questions out there. We're gonna talk about Chief Land, we're gonna talk about Wide out a few other things. Uh, hope that we have time at the end to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, but just starting with the discussion of this new uh, book, Cheap Land Colorado Off Gridders at America's Edge. Uh, a nice comment from the uh, Washington Post book review uh, Conover has made a career of immersing himself in seemingly impenetrable subcultures and then writing with sympathy and insight about his experiences. To read Cheap Land Colorado is to take a drive through a disquieting, beguiling landscape with an open-hearted guide, uh, which I thought was a, a nice way of putting it. And the book details a very engrossing landscape. It, uh, it centers on an area of the San Luis Valley in South Central Colorado, known as the Flats, where five-acre parcels of land can sell for as little as $5,000, but they uh, typically come without utility infrastructure, trash collection, even a cell phone signal. Um, uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, the area attracts a steady influx of settler types who are, who are drawn uh, because of this in, inexpensive prospect of living. And indeed, many of them Google cheap land Colorado, looking for a place they can uh, live, and they, are, and they find uh, they find this place. <clears throat> but they, they come, they set up shop, but often in camper trailers, doing whatever they can to eke out a living. Um, the book describes a way of life that may feel shocking to people accustomed uh, to the comforts of a middle-class modern American existence. Uh, he takes to a world that is impoverished. People are straining, often bartering, to meet basic needs such as food, water, heat. Um, it's a world that's prone to personal disaster, criminality, uh, premature death often. Uh, rejection of the mainstream is much more common than institutional attachments. Uh, but in other ways, it's a very proud place that you describe. <clears throat> People who are proud of their own resilience, uh, the very existence, they've managed to eke out. Um, so to start by asking, what brought you to this place and why did you want to write this book? That's a question I'm never <clears throat> exactly sure of the answer of, but um, a few years ago I was in Denver and had a beer with an editor at 5280 Magazine. Uh, and he uh, knew the kind of work I had done and asked if there's anything I was interested in writing about. And I, um, told him I was interested in writing about South Park, uh, which a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, it's sort of a small version of the San Luis Valley, much closer to Denver. And uh, I had visited there regularly during high school with a good friend whose family had an A-frame in, in uh, some trees on uh, way up Hoosier Pass. And uh, they got a cross-country ski there. Um, just, I'd always, uh, wanted to try to write something about the place. And uh, so he assigned me to do that. My friend came with me. Um, this is obviously years later. We drove around parts of the valley I had never been in before, including the area south of Hartzell. I don't know if 
uh, you know this part of, of South Park, but it's um, on your way to Colorado Springs from Fair Play. If you could look south of there, there's a huge uh, area which if you looked at it from Google Maps, you'd see this loose grid of dirt roads over it. And it was from a subdivision created in the 1970s that never took off. And as we drove through, it just it seemed like a ghost land. It, you could tell people had tried to live there. There were wrecks of old trailers and a few lean-tos. Um, there, there were some livestock. Just a, a scattering of, of dwellings. And I just thought, who's, who lives here now and why? Why, what, what would you get from living in, in a place like that? Because I'm sure somebody has to draw you if you make that choice. So anyway, um, I didn't really write about it in that article, but uh, later my sister, who lives in Denver, sent me photos from the San Luis Valley of uh, similar dwellings that she had seen uh, in her work uh, for the foundation. And, um, and she was right that I was interested. I, met, I didn't know people lived like that on this kind of scale in Colorado. Uh, and, and I'm sure people in the room have driven to uh, Santa Fe or Taos uh, through the San Luis Valley, and uh, you see the sand dunes, and then you just see lots of uh, prairie, right? Lots of grassland. and. If you look carefully uh, in certain areas, you see people living there. And uh, it, on a much bigger scale, actually, than in uh, South Park. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, and so, my, so my next question is always, how would I do, how would I write about this place? And, you know, and I thought, how would I write about prison in New York? I thought, how could I get, convicted of a crime, but I could still leave at the end of the month or something. <laughs> because I wanted, obviously, to get inside, but I didn't want to stay. And um, so it took a while to figure out getting a job might be the best way to do it. And that's a strategy I used in the uh, secretive enclave of Aspen, Colorado as well, where I, I got a job from, uh, from Mellow Yellow Taxi back uh, when it existed, and then at the Aspen Times uh, in the Dunaway days. And um, uh, I'm always looking for a way I can move beyond just the interview and do a deeper research by taking part in life myself. And, um, Turns out in the San Luis Valley, there's a charitable group called La Puente, which uh, runs a shelter, a homeless shelter in Alamosa, um, and other programs as well. And one of those programs is rural outreach. They try to keep off-gridders from becoming homeless when the weather gets cold, especially, because a lot of people who've, who've, who've uh, you know, built a beachhead out there on their five-acre lot find it gets colder than they thought. And it takes more wood or more propane than they expected to stay warm. And uh, and they tend to go to La Puente's shelter. And La Puente thought, well, if we could keep them from having to leave their uh, homestead, that would be better. So one thing led to another, and I liked the people there, and uh, they seemed to think I wasn't gonna cause too much trouble, and they let me become a volunteer. So that's kind of how I began. Your, your first night in your trailer, you got oh, yeah. frozen. Oh, no. did, did, did you think to yourself, what am I doing? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> <No. laughs> it's not really like camping I have done. I, I've done winter camping. I can kind of stay warm winter camping. Uh, but I never stayed in a camper trailer that had its own furnace. and I. Actually, I did one night in Alamosa, and I stayed warm, but then when I moved out to the prairie in my trailer, it I did not stay warm. And um, yes, I, you recall correctly, my the door froze. It got frosted inside, and I, the door froze. So in the morning when I was hoping to go out and uh, go to the bathroom, I could not. And, um, <laughs> uh, 
didn't want to kick the door. So it was my dwelling, and uh, it was a thin door, <laughs> but it was a strongly frozen door. And I, um, I thought, okay, I'll pretend everything's normal, and I'll brush my teeth. <laughs> and, uh, I went to brush my teeth. I was wearing a parka, and I uh, put this toothbrush in my mouth, and it felt like a rock. <laughs> so it was frozen. And uh, anyway, all of these projects involve humility because you realize you don't know so much, and it's the people out there living that way who, who do know what you need to know. And that's actually not a bad place to begin because here I am, an uh, East Coast journalist and college professor, and I'm trying to meet people who uh, don't like those people very much. Um, uh, I'm from New York. I mean, that's a terrible stigma to try to overcome. And um, uh, but if if what I'm asking is how to keep from freezing and how do you do it and what mistakes did I make, people love to point out your mistakes. And, um, and so that's not a bad um, opening. That, that's immersive journalism. That's immersive journalism. It's, it's not glamorous. So, so there's a theme in the book and, and the way it's framed is, you know, you need to go to the margins to really understand the mainstream. And, and there, there's an attempt, I, I think that's that's part of your intention yeah. in, in writing this. And, and you know, there's a comment in, in the early going of, of the book about how, you know, like many people uh, on the eve of the 2016 election, you thought there's no way that Donald Trump can win. It's just not possible in this country. And, and of course, we're proven wrong. And that in, in some way, this, this project was, um, it, it took off from that, you know, wanting to, to actually understand what was going on. So, so I would ask, how do you feel that your understanding of America's cultural and political divisions have been helped by this work? And what is important for uh, those who are unfamiliar to understand about the life and, and the culture of, of the flats? So it's true that uh, the election of Donald Trump made me think I was, uh, or it made me understand my silo a bit better. Um, I hadn't really paid attention to the silo I was in until uh, that took place and I thought I, I really uh, should get out for a while. Um, I think the margins of society are almost always fascinating. Um, I'm attracted to people living in ways that my friends don't know about, don't understand. There's a, Aspen's a bit of an exception to that rule. Um, but it is an extremity. And, uh, and so I, I was attracted to Aspen for that same reason. Uh, what did I learn in this experience? I, I learned all kinds of things. Um, like I didn't, when I went out there, I didn't know anybody who hated Hillary Clinton. And that seems so amazing right now, because I know so many people who do. Um, or I, though not that they think about it anymore much, but um, no, I, I be, I, it focused me on how many Americans have seen their standard of living fall in the last generation. Um, have seen themselves fall out of the middle class, have seen their dreams evaporate, and um, how many of them are white people who, um, who blame Democrats, I think, for not caring enough about people like them, especially those who live in rural, poor rural places. And uh, yeah, you know, the support uh, for the Democratic Party, Adam's here somewhere, we were talking about this earlier, uh, <laughs> in rural places has um, just plummeted over the last three presidential elections. And, um, and, and there's a reason, they, they feel ignored. Now, is, do they, is it fair that they feel ignored? Is, is it fair to blame people uh, with darker skin for what's happening to them? That's, that's a completely different question. But um, I started to understand that 
anger a little better. And, um, and I also learned to hold my tongue because uh, you hear about some outrageous things, uh, which I mean, everybody here who's online knows there's all kinds of crazy stuff floating around out there. But a lot of my neighbors believe some of it. And, um, and it's important to talk about why. Where did you hear that? Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> you know, where does that come from that you would believe something you heard on the internet over something you learned from a journalist? Oh, we don't like journalists so much either. Um, and why is that? And that's a really fascinating question. And I, it's one reason I'm just uh, happy Aspen journalism exists. Uh, and uh, and happy to be a, a professor of journalism because it's uh, it's so important. And I I get in these conversations and I say, well, I I read news where I can see what the source was, mm -hmm. and so I think the New York Times is a is a pretty reliable source. Not always, but pretty reliable. The first people I remember telling this to looked at each other like. Oh my God, we actually met somebody like him. Um, he reads the New York Times. <laughs> so uh, that's getting out of my silo. And that's, um, that's a good thing. And I find often that after the first half hour of getting past whatever's on the news or on the internet feed, you're, you end up talking to people like they're people. And like you're both trying to figure out uh, how to avoid the road that's, uh, you know, broken three axles on the way into Alamosa or the, um, uh, the weather that's coming in or, you know, everything else that makes us human that is not part of social media and not part of the current political uh, schism, so. Would you say that the experience gave you hope that these divides can be bridged? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Uh, <clears throat> so Cheap Land strikes me as does much of your work as an exercise in empathy. Uh, and, and I found at times that it was hard to process some of it because uh, it's so troubling is the hardship that some of these people are, are dealing with. And, you know, the same can be said for aspects of New Jack. I mean, you're, you're working in a, in a prison and, and sort of contemplating every day, uh, where's, where's the, uh, the boundary line between uh, safety and humanity and uh, all these things. So. Uh, it, it, in your process, you bear an unflinching witness to often hard times, uh, hard things, uh, and, and I, I wonder how do you endure that kind of work on a personal level? So New Jack was the hardest um, because that's such a bleak world. <clears throat> and there's, it's such a negative atmosphere, and to be in it uh, full time as an employee is is just a very rough thing, uh, and. You know, to be a, an officer is obviously better than being a prisoner, but you breathe the same air and you uh, you're, you share a culture, you, you share a, a special language uh, with the people you are telling what to do. And it, it's a, yeah, it's a, a rough thing to deal with. And because I had to be secretive about my role, I couldn't tell a lot of my good friends who I might normally want to bounce things off. Um, I'm incredibly lucky. Um, <clears throat> I'm lucky in all kinds of ways. I'm, I'm, a, I'm very, I'm privileged by my background, by my, um, by my education. I'm incredibly lucky um, to be married to somebody <laughs> who uh, is <clears throat> a stalwart and um, unflinching in uh, um, supporting me in difficult situations. And that's, that's really a precondition for these things. I think if I was a, I think if I were a single person, it would, I don't know if I could have worked in a prison that long. Um, but to be able to come home to uh, a wife and actually to my kids was uh, excellent. The second way with this book that I've managed is um, 
I became a volunteer for La Puente, and that means I can do some good things for people. Um, unlike in prison, where you say no all day long to people who want exceptions to the rules that would let them leave their cell and go talk to the guy in that cell, um, uh, I can say, do you need a, a coat? Do you need some firewood? Do you need, um, med you need a prescription picked up because you don't have gas to go get the prescription? And, and that was both uh, a way to help and then a way to introduce myself and say, by the way, I'm a journalist and I think the way you live is pretty interesting and uh, I wonder if I could talk to you about it sometime. And most people would say yes, not all. Some are like, no, <laughs> uh, bring me the wood, <laughs> be on your way. But uh, often, it, often uh, people like to talk and, you know, there's a lot of people who live out there are not eager to connect, but others I think are. And uh, as long as they don't think you're gonna become a security risk in some way, uh, as long as you're not too interested in their property, their marijuana, their whatever they might have, um, then yeah, it's, it's possible to get to know people. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So one of the um, most fascinating parts of the book, there's many, but um, just sort of unspooling the history yeah. of, of the San Luis Valley mm -hmm. is, is very fascinating. Uh, you know, you, you go all the way from the 17th century uh, explorers working for the Spanish crown who, who sort of led the first expeditions there, <clears throat> all the way up through the 1970s developers who were cited by the Federal Trade Commission for deceptive uh, marketing right. of the five-acre ranchettes that, that they sold and right. had ultimately had to cancel a lot of debts and it's sort of this legacy that's perpetuated to today where this land somehow doesn't even appreciate. Uh -huh. um, but could you talk a little bit about the history of the place and, and what you know, what were some of your, your most fascinating takeaways from it or what's important for people to understand? Hmm. So one thing that makes the San Luis Valley unusual is the degree to which uh, uh, Hispanic people who've lived there a long time feel this is their homeland, and that it is an, almost their birthright in certain parts of the valley. Uh, San Luis, that very old town, which is about a 20 minute drive from me, is sort of the heart of this uh, identity, and it's a very Proud identity. There's, you know, a whole uh, version of Spanish spoken in the valley that's not like other places. Has some things in common with uh, Spanish spoken in New Mexico, but it is a. It, the roots of that culture are old and deep, and that affects uh, lots of things there. Um, uh, one of the big surprises to me about the community that. I got to know, which is not in a town, it's between the towns out on the prairie, is that a lot of the people feel um, discriminated against by old, uh, old time residents of the valley. And they, uh, and there's some truth to it. Uh, they are sometimes called squatters. The, uh, the word in Spanish that's used to refer to them sometimes is ruinoso, which means like a squatter. You know, squalid, um, and uh, and they think um, you know anybody respectable would own land around the edges of the valley where there's trees and, and more water, and uh, uh, you know they associate life off the grid with criminality and uh, desperation or degeneracy, and it, again there's little grains of of truth in in these stereotypes that of people I live with there. There's a lot of people on, uh, you know, uh, with warrants out for their arrests. There's a lot of um, people who've done time, but there's a lot who haven't as well. And um, so it's a wide array of people and much more diverse than I ever expected. Um, and it, the comparison with the Roaring Fork Valley is, is just so fascinating. Uh, 
you know, oddly enough, both areas have a high percentage of absentee ownership. Um, if, you, um, if you compare all these, so in Castilla County, where I live, there are 45,000 five acre lots that were created in the 1970s. And there's just such an oversupply of them that they haven't appreciated. Uh, you can get them for less than $5,000. Uh, most of them are owned by somebody who is, is not nearby. They might live many states away, and they may never have even visited their land. But it only costs $49 a year in tax to own this land. And uh, um, originally when they were sold, you could buy them for $50 down and $50 a month. And it was like one of the only places in the United States you could buy land for no money down. So it's, um, uh, I guess, by contrast, so, you know, for that land to appreciate, there would just have to be this overwhelming demand, which I don't see happening anytime soon. By contrast, around here, it seems there's no limit to the demand, right? Like, prices seem to be able to just go up exponentially with no clear top and um, and and obviously it comes down to money and desirability but the money thing is really weird too because like it strikes me that here you know you might be lucky enough to to if you're not a person of wealth to uh, find a living situation that's sustainable in um, in Aspen or Basalt or further down Valley, but but there's but you're going to be the exception, right? You, you're not going to be on the same footing as as the as the people who who own most of the property, and so that's a very odd thing. And um, that's completely different from the San Luis Valley, where though I don't consider myself a wealthy person, almost always when I'm down there, I'm one of the most, the best off people I know. Uh, I, I always feel like I could afford almost anything. So it's so different. It's so completely different. And um, uh, I'm not sure what the lesson is here, um, but in, yeah, and trying to describe the difference or understand the difference. Uh, there's that, and there's also then the physical experience of the space. Like Aspen's beauty seems more gentle, and uh, you know, there aren't these vast, windy expanses where you'll freeze to death in 10 minutes in a January um, storm. Um, the, the, this, Around here, it feels more accommodating and gentle. The beauty down there, though, is un unbelievably uh, profound, and I, um, yeah, I, I find I miss it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what well, you suggest at the end of the book that you're going to hang on to your, your plot of land for a while, and you, yeah. got, you finally got your fence up, right? So yeah. is, is that is that the plan, or are you going to keep making trips down there? And yeah, are you going to come, come down? I'd love to. Um, okay. no, I I would like to keep going there. Um, the the risk in in owning anything there is uh, that if you leave, it won't be there when you come back, um, because. Uh, there's a lot of needy neighbors, and um, uh, it might just it might be your camper trailer, or if you actually built some a stick built something, it might be the windows or the pipes. I mean, it's this is why it's it's not the real estate is not about to take off. Um, <laughs> uh, and Maybe that's how we can hold our real estate prices. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, so yeah, uh, and I think about that a lot. I, I'm lucky to have a neighbor who, um, who's a lovely guy and, and uh, has a proprietary interest in, in my land. 
he, he gets very suspicious if anybody stops by, and that's exactly what you want, right? So um, anyway, no, I love, I love being down there. I, I hope to keep going. It's good. We'll, we'll, I mean, and people are uh, reading the book, and I haven't been threatened yet. <laughs> uh, but now everyone's going to love the book. Uh, I'm grateful to have a reporter from the San Luis Valley here uh, who um, uh, attended a lecture I gave at Adams State University. And uh, there was a, a, a person attending who seemed to wonder how I, what my right was to write about the valley. Like, what gives me the right? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, uh, as a journalist, this is kind of just what I do. Mm -hmm. I just go somewhere and decide I have the right to write about it. But I try to justify that by becoming knowledgeable and, um, and thoughtful and empathetic. And uh, she uh, didn't feel, though she hadn't read the book, but I didn't feel that um, I had interviewed enough people who were her neighbors. And I said, well, my book's about a very specific little world. It's about this little part of this giant valley. And um, uh, I, I tried to become an expert in the particularity of this place. And that often means the people there, right? It's not just the numbers about tax or um, real estate. It's who's there and what are they like? And when I was thinking about Aspen <coughs> earlier today and thinking about the Aspen, and it was the 80s mark when I was here, uh, um, you know, I think about people, uh, standout people who I met here who I wouldn't have known elsewhere. Um, uh, um, there's a, quite a long list of them, um, but I, you know, I think the fact that I met Nicholas DeVore the Third here, or um, Nancy Pfister here, or uh, Bruce Berger, or uh, Tukey Coffin, um, just people, I don't think I would meet these people other places, and that is part of why this place is special, right? And, um, and it's the same down there. I, it's particularity that I'm attracted to above all. Yeah. Places that are distinctive in, some, people, in people, some way. People, like why mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. uh, who, yeah, how, yeah, how did this person come to be here? Well, I, I do. I do want to um, move to, to talking about Aspen and talking about Whiteout. I'm more than thirty years old now. Um, I, the book stands up remarkably well. Oh, I think if you, if you read it today, you know it, it's very easy for me to recognize this this place. Although certainly some things have changed. Uh, what brought you to Aspen in the first place back then in the late '80s, and why did you decide it was interesting enough to write an entire book? About? Oh, I never doubted it would. Is that a surprise that it was interesting enough? I, I mean, and to be an Aspen local, that's kind of what, that was the promise of moving here. Like to understand a little bit of what that means, I guess is what I was after. Because that was something I think a lot of the world might have wanted to be at some point. And especially back then, right? Um, there was a sort of magic and a sexiness and a rebelliousness and a, a thing that wasn't happening anywhere else but here. And um, and yet, in the by the eighties, there was a sort of particular way to write about that, which was to write about Donald and uh, Ivana, right, or to write about uh, Don Johnson or um, all of the Hollywood people holding their Christmas parties at the Jerome, and um, and I thought, well, that is kind of interesting, but that's kind of also not interesting. It's kind of boring uh, compared to a whole other side of life here, and it's like a distraction or a diversion, and um, so that's why I thought, how do I learn about other things? And uh, but it, I never doubted that I had to worry about it being interesting. And, and, you, and you definitely write about the, some of the contradictions that are inherent in the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. workers and the, 
there, there's, um, I, I think there's sort of a cultural criticism at, at the heart of Whiteout. Um, and you, know, you, you talk about how you approach it, you know, growing up in Denver and uh, you know, riding the ski train up to Winter Park and all that. And, and, and it's like, coming from that perspective, you look up at Aspen like, those people just think they're, you know, it, that their poop doesn't stink, right? <laughs> well, the scheme's pretty good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you summarize this in the final, final chapter of Ride Out, Wide Out as you, you're contemplating leaving the valley, moving back to Denver, and you write, I was tiring of, for example, the joie de vivre of the stylized commercial fun of a resort town. Uh, all of Aspen skiing, nightlife, and celebration seem tantamount some days to the commercial rejection of sorrow. Aspen tried to institutionalize the idea of being upbeat, but after a while, it just didn't ring true. Um, yeah, I thought that was a point in line. I, I think, you know, many locals here maybe struggle with that a little bit. And, and how do we live these complete fulfilling lives in this place that's so much about this resort town experience and the hype and the fun, um, you know, when you really need a life that has a full range of, of emotion, right? Um, I do how do you feel about that today? Do you still sort of see that um, as part of the character here? Um, yeah. Uh, I, so I've been gone a long time, and everybody in the room knows uh, more about this than me, um, I think. But I, I think that then the resort part of Aspen maybe was more important. The idea of... Um, of skiing per se and of nightlife and I know it's still key and it's still central but I think the idea of living here and in the valley is a bigger deal now and sort of takes away from the ski co as the the god of everything right there's others now and um, and maybe even back then I in my mind the ski co was bigger than it was, but it, it just seems it's, it, you know, I think if skiing went away, Aspen would survive. I, I, I just, that's a feeling I have right now. I know I'm not sure if I'm right, um, but um, there's so much else to recommend it now that, um, yeah, so with that, that tension of co community versus commodity, mm -hmm. I guess is a, a way to put it, is, um, it, it's it's part of life in any resort town, and I guess after the pandemic, uh, it's more so than ever, right? As property values in any desirable mountain community or any desirable community anywhere in the country have skyrocketed as city people realize they can live outside a city and and locals or people who would become resort town locals sort of suffer. Uh, to some degree from that um, but I I think uh, no I I don't know I um, I love a sunny day and then I love a cloudy day and I uh, I like having both <laughs> um, you once described to me uh, that you saw um, Pickin County and Costilla County, where the flats are located, is, is sort of like a photo negative of, of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really interesting. I was wondering if you could um, expand on that a little bit. I think it's things I've already yeah. talked about in terms of um, income and uh, and hype and cachet. Um, yeah, beyond that, you know, there's uh, there's more non-white people in Southern Colorado than here, or at least it feels like that in Aspen. That's a difference as well. But, um, uh, yeah, and, the, and the, the fact that that there was silver here and wealth uh, creation could begin with the silver rush and, um, and that the people displaced by that were more what tribal people than agrarian people with a long history in a very specific um, area. Uh, that seems different a difference as well. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's it's very 
odd to go between these two places, but they're both kind of great, and um, I think it's manageable. That's good. Uh, well, we've used up almost all of our time here. Uh, I did want to open it up to the audience for questions, uh, maybe take four or five. Uh, all right, first hand up over there, and, and we, we do have mics if, uh, if that would be helpful. I think I could probably speak to that okay. right now. Um, the question is, can you share your view of sort of tribalism and journalism, and more specifically, how does journalism reach people who are not searching for truth at the extremes? I, I think people I've met would question the language of that, of your, of your sentence. Uh, I'd say they, they would say they're searching for truth, but they've lost faith in the ability of journalists to supply it. Um, and and uh, you know, this is a problem that predated the Trump presidency and all the fake news charges. I think there's been a slide in the public's trust of journalists for a long time now. And I'm not, I'm not convinced I know uh, a solution for it other than you know, I think when I see like in today's paper, today's New York Times, there's a story about how the conservative press is covering the uh, votes for the Speaker of the House, right? So this is in a way, to me, the Times acknowledging that we're not the conservative press, okay? That's somebody besides us. Back in the day, I think they pretend they were the press, that they were truth for everybody. And I think now they're more explicit about being, you know, embracing us progressive values that a lot of their journalists hold dear, I know. I know a lot of journalists there who, who uh, struggle both with wishing their times were more progressive and wishing it was less so, you know, uh, that they have to worry about being correct in how they um, approach stories. But I think the press is, is more self-aware of its audience, and that's, that's partly a result of digital culture, which lets you see very clearly who's reading your stories and how many of them. Um, and, um, but yeah, how to do a better job and be a medium for a bigger audience is such a vexing question and um, I saw a really interesting uh, analysis in the journalism newsletter from uh, Harvard's Shorenstein Center uh, this week where they analyzed uh, journalism from mainstream papers and then from extreme media in terms of the sophistication of the language and the the degree of education it would take to appreciate the article. And the uh, uh, media on the extremes had simpler language. It was easier to grasp what they were saying. And I guess if you're the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, you would introduce more nuance in your reporting and in your writing, and your sentences get longer. And the suggestion was that could be a problem if you're trying to reach a broader cross-section of people, that journalists need to be more aware of directness and simplicity in our language. I, it's just an idea. I'm not sure that's actually the solution at all. I like, I like feeling I'm being written to by somebody who assumes I'm intelligent. I think you might as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Do, do you see a value in taking Aspen school children and having to take field trips to the San Luis Valley? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I, um, I'm sure there would be wonderful things they would see and learn, uh, and vice versa. If kids from there could spend time here, I think it would, it could be good. Um, but yeah, you'd need to be paying close attention to, uh, to the children's experience and what they were seeing and how they were processing it. I would, I mean, I'm all for cultural exchange, but I, I want to move slowly. Yeah.
That was one of my questions that was left on the floor. Is what do you make of the of sort of the, the mysticism, the spiritual awareness going on? So, um, you know, when I was in Aspen, the New Age was sort of ascendant, and um, uh, there was a uh, a guy named Larry. What was his last name? He came into the Aspen Times to talk to John Colson about a gathering of this group of people who believed that, um, that there was going to be a landing of a craft in, in the valley in the next couple weeks. And, uh, and I kind of finagled an invitation to go. And I attended this meeting. And, and uh, even though he disinvited me, I went anyway. And then he let me stay. And, um, um, so, down in the valley, there, you know, UFOs, I, ha I haven't seen one, but in the time I've spent there over the last five or six years, I'd say, I'd say probably half of the people I cross paths with bring it up, and, and including at La Puente, including very sober, church-going people who, um, who, who were not like this group that I uh, got to know here, and I don't know what to make of it. I, I don't say it's impossible. I, I can't say I believe in them, but uh, I've heard very persuasive stories from very sober people. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> we we'll have probably have time for two more questions. Okay. Eleanor, all the way in the back. I'm wondering, you mentioned the people and their stories a couple of times, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the one or two of the people that really made an impact on you. Oh, sure. Well, if, if you read the book, you'll learn a lot about the Gruber family. It's a mom and dad and five girls. They, um, they moved from uh, Casper, Wyoming to Greeley to the valley. They bought five acres. Uh, um, I rented a corner of their lot uh, because it seemed the best way to live out there and uh, got to know them pretty well. When they then moved a few miles away, I moved with them. Um, they homeschooled their girls. Uh, the parents didn't finish high school. So I have wondered how, what kind of education they are getting, like how good an education can you get if your parents didn't finish high school. That said, it's a loving family and the girls are so nice to each other and they know so much about lots of things, especially their natural environment. Um, uh, Anyway, you'll learn a lot about them in the book. You'll learn about my neighbor, Troy, who grew up there, um, lost his leg in uh, a farm machinery. Well, he poured gasoline into a carburetor and got blown up into the air. And uh, He has one leg, and um, in the book, he's, he's drinking beer all the time, but right after I wrote the epilogue, he stopped drinking beer. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to write another epilogue. Um, um, he's a great guy. Uh, he's, yeah, his wife, uh, I asked her how she met him, and she had moved from Aurora, Colorado, where she was one of the original Lyft drivers. She still has the pink Lyft mustache on the wall over her refrigerator. Um, she said, well, of all the alcoholics out here, he was by far the nicest. <laughs> and he's sitting right there with his beer, and he, he, he agreed. So um, um, the second person I met is my neighbor, Paul, who, when I was introduced to him, said, hi, my name's Paul, and yes, I'm gay. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, uh, he... Uh, I mean, that, right there, I thought maybe it's hard to be gay here, right? Because it's what, it's rural America, must be hard. He's, he's all about being out and being loud about it. And uh, 
and people ask him, does he have a gun? And he goes, no, I don't have a gun. And I keep saying, don't tell them, Paul. <laughs> don't tell people. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's some people out, uh, who I've been disappointed by after I've learned more about them. An 80-year-old man who fixed up an old cabin. I mean, he worked hard on that. And um, La Puente helped him. He started uh, offering church services at this decrepit church in the town of Mesita. And... Um, and then the uh, Castilla Sheriff's Department arrested him because uh, they'd gotten a tip. He was an unregistered sex offender. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you, how, what do you do with that, you know? When you know somebody and you've gotten to like them, but then you learn that. And, um, and there's other things like that that have happened out there. Uh, and I'm very, I include them all. I'm not trying to make it seem nicer than it is or worse, but there's just, uh, yeah, it, there's a world of humanity, and um, uh, and maybe you know if you're as poor as some of them are, it's harder to hide uh, your addiction or your your past transgressions, right? It, it might be a little harder if you don't have money to do that um, but now I uh, I, I uh, I've met a lot of people and um, uh, that's, that's enough of that question <laughs> uh, all right one more Harry um, so forgive this question a little bit but do you have another project in your sites and, and would you be willing to share with it or them with us? No, but I, I would, I'm happy to solicit new ideas. <laughs> um, I, I've never known when I finished a project what the next one would be. And um, I sometimes feel my mind just has to clear out. I have to, ever think of your brain as having RAM memory? <laughs> that um, when you turn the computer off, it goes away. So I've been sort of shutting the computer down the last few months from uh, that subject, and I'll start it up again pretty soon and um, see what comes in. What's... Why not two? <laughs> Why not two? <laughs> One more question for the engineer. Uh, yeah, Bill. You have a way about you, by the way. You have a, a gentle manner. You have an intelligence, and you have an egalitarian kind of approach to people. And I think that gives you access in a way that not many people can do that. There's a very scathing critique of your book in the two, two weeks ago in New Yorker, which you have written for before too mm. as well. And they say you're too much centered in the story right. and you don't bring those people out. I'm about halfway through the book and I'm wrapped. And I was really surprised by that criticism. What did you think? I was surprised too. Thank you. <laughs> I I went so far as to do something I've never done before, which is to write a letter to the editor of the New Yorker because I know him, and I said at least four things in this review are not true, um, uh, and um, uh, I don't know what I wanted uh, him to do in return. I did see that the book the next week made their list of best books of the year. <laughs> thank you so much, Ted, and thank you for being on